First, we'll read from the book of Numbers, chapter 12. And I just want to read a verse of scripture here from Numbers, chapter 12, and verse 3. The word of the Lord says this Now, the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. And I want you to notice just the strong language used to describe the meekness of Moses. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. From the gospel according to Matthew chapter 25, I want to begin reading just a few verses of scripture beginning at the 14th verse. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods and unto one he gave five talents to another two and to another one and to every man according to his several ability and straightway took his journey then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents and likewise he that had received two he also gained other two but he that had received one he that had received one talent went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. And I want to speak to you for just a few moments this evening on this subject. The only talent you need. The only talent you need. Can we lift up our voices and ask God to bless the preaching of his word? In Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you. For every soul that is gathered into this place, I thank you for every individual, Lord, that has come to receive of your good hand. I pray that your word will go forth, directed by your spirit. Allow it to accomplish that where to it is sent. Help us, I pray, in Jesus' name, to sit together in heavenly places in you. Help us, Lord, to receive the bounty of life that can only come from your presence. Lord, I pray that every person, hallelujah, every person that hears this word will be changed and challenged, stirred by the preaching of the word of God. We ask for your anointing and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. And amen. Could you clap your hands one more time unto the Lord? Amen. 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 Thank the Lord. God bless you. You may be seated. When we use the word talent, that word is very common to us and, and the meaning of it and the understanding of it is common to us. If I were to walk up to you and commend you for how talented you are, you would know what I meant. You would know that I meant that you have a good deal of gifts and abilities and that they are uh, appealing and valuable. The word talent in this passage of scripture is referring to currency. The scripture, Matthew 25, 14 through 18, it is referring to currency. The talents that were received from this man in the parable of Jesus. And yet the word talent had a meaning even before it meant currency, it had a a meaning where it, it actually referred to weight. It referred to the weight of a, of a thing. And, and so when we use the word talent today as we would in, in the context of giftedness or in the context of uh, various abilities, it is actually the same word. It, it's not a different word. The word has remained the same and and it, I don't know that I would say that it is defined differently or that it has become more defined. I would say it has probably become more refined, more refined, because the word has still the same meaning as it did when it was only seen as a weight, and it has the same meaning as when it was only seen as a currency, but the spirit of it and the understanding of the word has become more refined in the sense that now we know it doesn't just 
refer to weight or currency, but it refers to intangible qualities as well. Certain skills and certain abilities. And, and all of it centers around the same idea, which is something of value in the marketplace. When a talent had significant weight, it, the more that it weighed, the more value it brought in the marketplace. And then, of course, in its form of, of simply currency, it, it had value in the marketplace. And these intangible gifts that we call talents or even these tangible skills that we call talents, we call them that because just like the antiquated usage of the word talent, this talent to which we refer today also refers to valuable tangible or intangible qualities in the marketplace. Something that you can take to market and receive goods in return. So when I tell you that you are quite talented, what I'm telling you is that you are able to take whatever giftedness you have and go cast it upon the waters and it will come back to you. You, you can take whatever giftedness you have inside of you and maybe, maybe you have... Uh, an engineering mind where when you look at something, there's just a natural inquisitive uh, uh, questioning in your mind. How does that work? And you, you just want to pull it apart and, and check the inner engine of it and look at what is motorizing it. And you want to figure it out. You're, you have this, this propensity to engineer something. And you want to know what makes certain things tick. That, that's a gift. That, that can, you can actually take that gift to the marketplace and receive goods in return. Maybe you're a numbers person. Maybe numbers make sense to you, multiplying them and adding them and subtracting them and dividing them. And numbers just make sense. And you even understand perhaps the abstract form of numbers. And, 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 and you can see where they align geometrically and, and, and how that they can actually take you into certain uh, fields of thought that you can build things by understanding these numbers. Or maybe numbers in terms of finance make sense to you. Or maybe music notes make sense to you. Maybe you can actually use your voice to, to match notes on a piano. And, and you can move up and down a scale and your voice very easily glides up and down that scale. That's a talent. That's giftedness. Those, those are abilities. Maybe you just have this great big personality where you never meet a stranger and, and you kind of enjoy talking to people. And when you meet somebody, you, you, you kind of want to know where do they come from and what brought them to where they are now and what's their story. And this larger-than-life personality, this great big sunshine smile, that's a talent. These are all marketable talents. Maybe you are a peacemaker, a people person, a, 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 a person who knows how to resolve conflict. I was on the airplane on my way here, and I saw a lady trying to fit a bag into the overhead compartment. And the bag was refusing to go into the overhead compartment. She felt like it could make it there and be just fine, but the bag disagreed with her. And the flight attendant came down the aisle and the flight attendant was so gentle and so kind and so careful and so easily resolved the issue. And I thought that was a blessing to have somebody who understood conflict resolution and how to deal with people. And she was very careful and kind and just helped the lady through the situation. That's a talent. And that talent helps her to do well in her field. And so this is the way uh, talents work. And so when we look at this parable of Jesus, when he's talking about talents, yes, it's referring to currency, but it's not really different from when we talk about talents because we're still talking about things you can take to market. And we're still talking about things the master gives us. And in this parable, the master gave three servants a varied number of talents. So one 
servant received five talents and another servant received two talents and then another servant received one talent. And we know about the five-talented servant because that five-talented servant took those five talents and he invested them wisely. The Bible says that he took his money to the exchangers. Those five talents, he saw their value, he saw their worth, he looked at them and said, you know, I, the master has been pretty generous with me and I can take these five talents and I can, I can, I can cast them into the market and the forces of the market will, will take hold of these talents and begin to multiply them and reproduce them. And when his master returned from his long journey, he came back and said, I have, I have invested those talents wisely. And the master was well pleased and added unto him more talent. The two talented servant, he didn't have five, but he had two. He kind of maybe wished he'd had five. Five would have been nice, but at least he had two. And he said, you know what? I could take two and make something out of that. So he took those two talents that he had and, and he did with those two talented, talents what the five talented servant did with the five talents. He put them to work in the market and, and they were able to reproduce and the master when he returned looked upon that good sense, that, that, that innovative thinking, that creative way and was pleased and said, we're going to add more talents to you because, because you took what I gave you and you did something with it. And then there's the one talented servant. And he's kind of the villain of the story. If there's a villain in this story, he's kind of the villain or at least he's the, he's the example of what not to do. He's the example of what not to be. He's the one talented servant. And when I look at this story, I, I mean, there's a little bit of empathy perhaps for him because, I mean, he did only get one talent. The other two got all kind of stuff. The, the, the first guy got five talents. The second guy got two talents. And then this third guy gets one talent and he looks at it and he's like, well, what am I supposed to do with this? He's given, he's just handing out talents to everybody. Everybody's getting all kinds of talents. But all I've got is this one measly, old, washed up, burned out, broken down, useless, worthless, one talent. And he, the Bible says, he just buried it in the earth. Some would say he threw it away. I would argue that he didn't throw it away. He invested it all right, but he invested it in the world. And when you invest it into the world, the world you're going to get what the world can offer. And so he, he invested it in the wrong thing. He invested it in this earth. And when the master came from the long journey, he said to the master, I knew that you were a hard man. I, I knew that you reapest where you do not straw. And, and, and so I, I just went and, and, and I, 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 I buried it in the earth. And the master was, was very displeased and, and, and pronounced judgment upon him and took it away and took the talent away and gave it to the, the, the servant who had five and now ten talents. And, and, and it was this classic example of how not to live. Of what not to do. And here's, here's the first thing I want to tell you. Because I think some of us might be able to relate to this one talented servant. It's really easy to look over at five talented people and think. Well I could do that too if I had all those advantages. It's really easy to look over at a two talented servant and say. You know what if I had that kind of a home life. Or if I had that kind of a support system. If I had, if I had that kind of money. If I, if I had that kind of giftedness and that kind of talent and I had people in my corner like that then maybe I could have done something but all I got was this measly old talent and I don't even know how do you how do you multiply with one 
I can multiply with five. I can multiply with two. But how do you multiply with one? I want to I tell you it's so easy to underestimate the power of one. And here's what you and I need to understand. While the one talented servant just had no use for his talent, and he saw that talent as being worthless to him, the master had confidence in that one talent. The master didn't think he was handing him junk. He didn't think he was handing him trash. He didn't consider that this would ever be frowned upon or disliked or considered to be distasteful. No, in fact, it's arguable that he was putting more confidence in this one talented servant than any others because he was expecting him to do something. He didn't ask any of the other servants to do. I want you to bring something strong and positive out of one old talent. And the one talented servant just could not get his eyes off of what other people had. Beware of covetousness. Beware of envy. Beware of looking around at the blessings of other people. It's tempting to, to be so self-centered that you begin to think other people have it good and you have it bad. I want to tell you what the elders would tell you. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. You've got to start thanking God for something. You'll never enter into his gates any other way than with thanksgiving. You'll never enter into his courts any other way than with praise. Hallelujah. When we enter into his gates, we can only enter with thanksgiving. You've got to thank God for something. For something. Thank him for something. You say, I don't, I don't know what I have to be thankful for. Are you kidding me? You're breathing right now. Are you kidding me? Your heart is beating right now. Are you kidding me? There's blood flowing through your body. You woke up this morning. <laughs> and there's a real good possibility you wake up tomorrow morning. You ought to thank God for something. If you can't think of anything else, thank God for the blood. In sin I wandered sore and sad with bleeding heart and aching head. But Jesus came and sweetly said, I'll take your sins away. Thank God for the blood of Jesus. We've got to stop complaining. We've got to stop murmuring. We have to stop disputing. We have to stop bemoaning. We have to stop moping. And we've got to start praising the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Now, understand, his praise may not always be in my emotions, but his praise will always be in my mouth. I, I, might, I might struggle a little bit sometimes in my flesh with how it seems like other people are blessed, and I'm over here wrestling with this one talent, but I'm not going to let that come out of my mouth. God has been too good to me. I'm going to praise him until my attitude gets right. I'm going to praise him until the envy of my flesh is crucified to the cross of Christ. I'm going to praise him until I get my eyes back on the prize. Focus where they need to be. Don't underestimate the power of one. One is a lot more significant than you're giving it credit for. You, you, you're so busy looking at the five talented servant and the two talented servant wishing you were them or wishing you had their advantages and God has given you the only talent you actually need and you just want to discard it because it's not what you want it to be but don't underestimate the power of one here's the multiplying power of one whatever it multiplies itself with that's what it is one times five is, is five. One times ten is, is ten. 
So if you will take that one that you've got and multiply it by God, guess what it becomes? If you take that one talent, Pastor, and multiply it by the anointing of God, it becomes anointed. If you take that one talent you've got and multiply it by the Spirit of the Lord, it becomes spiritual. If you take that one talent, don't underestimate the power of one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. No, 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 no. Don't worry if you don't got five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, or twelve talents. And the guy sitting next to you has more than that. And, and, and the lady sitting across the aisle, the girl down the aisle, she's got like the two times that amount. And you've, you're wondering, do I even have a talent? Oh, yeah, you've got a talent. At least one. And it's the only talent you need. Hallelujah. You know, these five talented, two talented, one talented servants, we, we know some of those folks, some of those five talented servants who can just do anything, and it's like, that's not even fair. And you look in the word of God, and you see them. They're, they're, all, they're scattered throughout the word of the Lord. I, I'll tell you, a five talented servant in the Bible, a five talented servant in the Bible is, is King David. There's a reason he's the king. This man is multi-talented. He can do so much. He is, he is a, of course, he's a prolific, uh, he's a prolific uh, musician. He just plays any instrument he gets his hands on. And he's done it since he was a child. I mean, the harp, he just strums the harp. Stringed instruments, organs, whatever, trumpets, loud cymbals, high-sounding cymbals. And then he commands us to do it like we're supposed to know how to do all this stuff. <laughs> He's like, praise him. Praise him like this. And he starts playing the harp. Praise him like this. Loud cymbals and high-sounding cymbals. This, this man is multi-talented. And, 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 and this man could sing. And he, he was telling everybody to sing. You'll feel so much better when you sing praises to the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto him, O ye isles of the earth. Sing unto him, O ye nations. Sing, all of nature sing. Every man, woman, boy, and girl, sing, sing. This man was a singer. He was such a good singer and such a good musician that the king Saul actually brought him in to play the harp before the Lord and drive away the evil spirits. And I want to encourage young people in 2022, learn how to play instruments. We need you to learn how to play musical instruments. The church needs musicians. Learn, learn the keyboard, learn the organ, learn the bass guitar, learn the acoustic guitar, learn instruments and use it for the glory of God. Play skillfully before the Lord. Play like the minstrel played before Elisha the prophet prophesied. Prepare the hearts of the people. Usher them into the presence of God. Don't let your ability outweigh your character and your integrity. Be be a Christian who is able to play skillfully before the Lord. Have integrity in your heart and be anointed as you play instruments before the Lord. Can I get a witness? Build your skill set. Build your ability. Build, the, build your ability to play instruments before the Lord. David had all kinds of instruments that he played and he, and he sang songs and he didn't just sing songs, he wrote songs. Now, not every singer who sings and plays can, can write their own songs. Elvis did not write his own songs. I know a lot of people think he did, but he wasn't nothing but a hound dog, <laughs> lying all the time. Elvis did not write his own songs. But some, some musicians do. They, they, they put the music to it and they put the words to it. David could write songs under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, of course. He could play music. He could, he could, he could sing beautifully. And not every musician sings beautifully. David sang beautifully, played beautifully, wrote beautiful songs, and he could dance. 
I mean, this just isn't fair. This guy could, this guy could do, he's known for, we sing songs like, I'm going to dance like David danced. He danced, he sang, he played, he wrote, and he was a warrior. He had like deadly aim on the battlefield. As, a, as just a youth, as just a child, he was able to bring down the most vicious of warriors in opposing armies. He could throw a lion around by his beard. He could throw a bear around at will. He was a warrior. He was a musician. It's just not fair how talented this guy was. You look at other characters in the word of the Lord. You, you've got Nehemiah. Nehemiah was like this amazing engineer who, who just could walk up into a city and look at it through the night and decide, okay, this is going to go over there and that's going to go over here. And he was a leader of leaders. He gathered, he gathered a whole nation together to rebuild the wall when they faced the most serious of opposition. And he motivated them and inspired them to stay on the wall and rebuild that wall. And he must have had a larger than life personality. He was like pure sunshine. He had one off day and the king was like, wait a minute, why aren't you smiling? <laughs> one day where he didn't laugh at a joke and the king was like, hold up. Nehemiah's got a little frown on his face and that's not like Nehemiah. He just, this guy had talent oozing from every which direction. Joshua, what a, what a talent he was. He was a talented leader, but he was also a talented follower. Talented people. Multi-talented. Five, two, three, four, all kinds of talents. And they used them for the glory of God. And God blessed them and God poured favor upon them. And then you got my man Moses. And Moses just wasn't, he wasn't quite what those guys were. I, uh, I don't want to disparage him because he's one of the greatest men that ever walked the face of the earth. And he gave us the law of God from Mount Sinai. But Moses had his own challenges. He had his own issues. You know, Moses was not a good speaker. When the Lord told him to go speak and communicate with Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Moses said, I can't do that. The Lord said, I'm telling you to go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And Moses said, but Lord, you know, I, I don't have the ability to speak. I am of slow speech. My words don't come quickly. I, I stumble over them. I get nervous. I, I, I'm not an orator. I... I, I don't, you're asking me to do something I don't know how to do. I, and you know, of all, of all people, you, you of course know, I am of slow speech. This man, Moses, the mighty man, Moses, he could hardly speak. Not only was he a, a very poor speaker, but he was also a poor administrator. He was leading those people and leading those people, he he ran into so many problems. He was trying to do so much. He was trying to lead them and take care of all their problems. And hundreds of thousands of people were coming to Moses for all their problems. And he was burning the candle at both ends. And his father-in-law had to intervene and say, it can't be like this. You're going to have to put leaders over people. And he had, to, he had to like literally sit down with Moses and start spelling out what leadership looks like. This is the guy that God chose to lead his people out of bondage. And he couldn't lead. And he couldn't speak. And he had a temper problem. When he saw an injustice, he, he just something would boil up inside of him and his temper was completely lost and he would, he would move into a righteous rage and if it meant that the, that the man perpetrating the deed was dead when he was done, then that's just what it meant. Moses had, a, he had a, an anger issue. That anger issue caught up with him when he was standing before the rock and God told him to speak to the rock and Moses was so mad that instead of speaking to the rock, he smote the rock and it cost him entering into the land of promise. Moses had his issues. He wasn't diligent. He was not a detail person. 
He was not oriented to details. He received all the instructions of God about leading Israel out of Egypt. And he was going to go do what God told him to do. And while he's marching on with a newfound zeal, the Bible says that his own son was uncircumcised. And his wife had to take care of it. And and she was angry at him. And God was so angry that God almost killed him that night. He wasn't detail-oriented. He was a poor manager. He couldn't speak well. He, was, he, so he, he, he had so many issues, anger issues and temperament problems. And, and yet Moses could part waters. And yet Moses could call bread from heaven. And yet Moses could bring water from a rock. And yet Moses could make bitter water sweet. And yet Moses could construct a tabernacle in the middle of the wilderness and take it up with him wherever he went. Moses was God's chosen man. So how does a man who lacks so much talent do something so great for God? I'm going to tell you why. Because while he may not have had five, three, two, four talents, he had the only talent that you'll ever need. Because the Bible says that Moses was very meek. That he was the meekest man to walk the face of the earth. That nobody was as meek as Moses. And what that means is that Moses was lowly or he was humble. So while Moses might have had a little temper problem, he was humble. And while Moses might have had an inability to really strategize and form and develop teams, he was humble. And while Moses may not have been a great orator or a tremendous speaker, Moses was humble. And I've come to tell you, it doesn't matter where you come from. If you don't have humility, you don't have anything. If you don't have humility, you don't have anything. And if you do have humility, you can do anything. There is nothing you can't do for the Lord if you have a humble heart. Hallelujah. If you understand like Moses understood that I can do nothing without the Lord. There was one time where the Lord told Moses to go forward, to pick up and go. And Moses said, Lord, are you going with us? Because if you're not going with us, I'm not going. I can do nothing without you. There is nothing I can do without you. I don't have the ability. I don't have the talent. I don't have the skill set. I'm going to tell you, Bishop, I'd rather be in that position than in the position of having talent and thinking you don't need God. I'd rather be in that position than to be in the position of having ability and think I can handle this on my own. You can't handle anything on your own. You need God for everything you attempt to do. Uh, I can already hear it. People saying, yeah, but I worked hard. Yeah, but I, 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 I do have talent. And I'm proud of the talent. You're what? Well, I'm proud of what you, wait, you're, you're what? You're proud? Pride goeth before destruction. Haughty spirit before a fall. Don't be proud of anything. Well, I'm talking about the good kind of pride. Where's that in the Bible? Where is that good pride we always talk about? Where's that that godly pride we always talk about? There's nothing good that the Bible says about pride. Anything we say I'm proud of, I'm proud of. Sometimes I have to tell my girls, girls, I'm going to have to repent because I'm really proud of you right now. 
And I'm not supposed to be proud. I can be joyful. I can be grateful. I can, I can rejoice. I can celebrate. But pride. You want to know why I can't be proud? Because I have to have a constant understanding. It wasn't me. It was God. Hallelujah. I've got great daughters. But it's because of God that I have great daughters. Hallelujah. It's not because I'm anything. And my wife and I did the best we could. But we could only do the best we could. Because God gave us the ability. God was there for us. God led us. God anointed us. I know you've got a great education, but God gave you the brain to learn that information. And God gave you the endurance, to, the wherewithal to endure that educational pursuit. It wasn't you, it was God. And you better get used to saying, God did it. God did it. God did it. Hallelujah. The Bible says, by grace are you saved through faith. And this, you have to understand, it is by the grace of God that we are saved. It is, it is not us. It is Him. It is by the grace of God that we are saved. It is because God is good, not because we are good. It is because God is holy, not because we are holy. It is because God is righteous, not because we are righteous. We can only be righteous because he's righteous. We can only be holy because he's holy. I have nothing without him. He said, by grace are you saved. Through faith. And this is where we, we sometimes get it mixed up. By grace are you saved through faith. Because the faith part, that's sometimes where we get it mixed up. Because we, we like to say, yeah, but I had to believe. I had to repent. I'm the one that had to get baptized in Jesus' name. I'm the one that had to speak in tongues and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. But the Bible says, by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Even the faith is the gift of God. Oh, I know the blood is the gift of God. And I know that the, that the, the, the crucifixion was the gift of God. And I know Jesus laying down his life was the gift of God. But even you believing it was the gift of God. Even you hoping is the gift of God. Even you having a spiritual inclination is the gift of God. There is nothing good about us. I need to say it again. There's, there's nothing good about us. There's, there's nothing good. Every good and perfect gift cometh down from above. It cometh down. Hallelujah. It's not, it's not derived from around here. And it's not derived from in here. It cometh down from the Father of light. Those lights, the Father of lights, those lights that is enlightenment. It is a gift of God that involves enlightenment. God enlightened you, and that's how you believed. God enlightened you, and that's why you repented. God enlightened you, and that's why you were baptized. God enlightened you, and that's why you were tarrying for the Holy Ghost. Not because you're anything special or because I'm anything special, but because God is so good. I look at the Apostle Paul, and the Apostle Paul was brilliant. He was a brilliant man. He was a lawyer, and he, he, he studied cultures. He could communicate with anybody on any level. He testified to kings and governors. He, 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 could, he could quote Greek poets on Mars Hill. He was a brilliant man. But this man said, I have no confidence in the flesh. There's just simply no confidence in my flesh. But the same man who said, I have no confidence in my flesh, is the same man who said, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me and I've come to tell you that the only talent you will ever 
actually need is the talent of humility the ability to understand that I can't do it but God can do it I'm nothing but he's everything Oh, I can feel somebody's trying not to believe it. Somebody's trying not to believe it. But I've come to preach to you the word of life. If you will humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, he will exalt you in due season. And when God exalts you, friend, I said when God exalts you, something special happens. Something you don't have any of the arrogance when God exalts you. You don't have any of the any of the cockiness when God exalts you. You, you don't have any of the any of the condescension toward others when God exalts you. When you exalt yourself, you're gonna be arrogant. But when God exalts you, He only does it because you're humble. That's the only talent you actually need. And if you have that talent, That preaching that you think you can do so well, you wait till you're humble about it. My God. That singing that you feel so gifted at doing, you wait till you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. God will break chains in the people who hear you sing when you're humble in his presence. You thought you could play an instrument? I tell you what, you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and give glory and honor to Jesus. Give glory and honor to Jesus. Give glory and honor to Jesus. Humble yourself. Humble yourself. Humble yourself. I want to tell you that the anointing of God will flow through you. I want you to know that the anointing of God will destroy the yoke. Of those with whom you interact. <laughs> Hallelujah. You, 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 you might, not, might as well not even try if you're not going to be humble. And, and, and uh, humility is one of those unique things. Brother Tinney said, humility is that elusive quality that the moment you know you've got it, you don't. <laughs> you, you can't know that you're humble. You can't even think that you're humble. Here's humility. You have to have a constant awareness that it's God, it's God, it's God, it's God, it's God, it's God. It's God, it's God. It's God. It's God. Well, that was a good sermon. It's God, it's God, it's God. That was a good Bible study. It's God, it's God, it's God. Well, you did great in your career. It's God, it's God, it's God. How'd you become so successful? It's God, it's God, it's God. There has to be a a carefulness, a walking with carefulness to understand there will be no boast in my flesh. This flesh is just a dirt bag of bones and life is a vapor that appeareth for a little while and then it vanishes away. Any good thing is God. Any great thing is God. Hallelujah. Give all glory and honor to Jesus. You know where humility comes from? Humility comes from God. That's how you get humility. You ask God for it. And he will give it to you. I prayed that prayer one time when I was a teenager. I was just caught up in praying. And I, when I was in the middle of praying, I, I shouted out. I said, oh God, make me humble. And then I thought, I, I remember a saint of God saying, don't never ask God to make you humble because he will. And I said, oh wait, hold on. Back up, delete, 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 delete. Can you erase that from the record of my prayers? I don't know if I really want you to make me humble, but do, do, you know what I want you to do. Can you do whatever it is my heart is wanting you to do? And the Lord said something to me that, that has stuck with me all my life. He said, never be afraid to ask me for anything. God can give you humility and not humiliate you. 
You can ask him for anything. Somebody said, don't ask God for patience. Where else are you going to get it from? You want it to come from God. You want humility to come from God. Because when it comes from God, it's going to be a revelation of his nature. It's not going to be about you trying to out humble people and you trying to poor mouth yourself. It's not going to be a false modesty. It's going to be a real, true, genuine awe of the nature of God. And the bigger that he gets, the smaller you get. Oh, hallelujah. And you stop worrying about things because you realize it's God's. It's God's. It belongs to him. You stop fearing things because it's all in the hands of God. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. I'm in the hands of God. I'm not worried about what will happen tomorrow because it's in the hands of God. My life belongs to him. My ministry belongs to him. My marriage belongs to him. And if I give everything to him everything will be all right don't worry if you don't have a lot of money all you need is humility don't worry if you don't have a lot of musical ability all you need is humility and if you have humility God can take that one talent and make something beautiful out of it See, pride will tell you that if you're not preaching or singing on a great big stage, you're not doing anything for God. But the greatest prophet who ever prophesied was the voice of one crying, not on a general conference platform, in the wilderness. That was his audience just out in the middle of nowhere, crying with a loud voice, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah, no, 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 no. I, I know there are a lot of great talented servants and God bless them and they're doing great works for God. But the only talent you actually need and cannot do life without is the talent of being humble before the Lord. If my people which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. Shall humble themselves. Hallelujah. When the youth pastor talks to you about an issue that you need correction, humble yourself. When the pastor brings the word and correction begins to prick your heart, humble yourself. That's, that, that, at the end of the day, that's all you really, absolutely, 100% must have is humility. And if you can have humility, you can part waters. And if you can have humility, you can perform the miraculous. And if you can have humility, you can lead the people of God. And if you have humility, you can raise up a mighty family. And if you have humility, God can do things through you that he won't be able to do through anybody else. I wonder if somebody could lift their hands to the one true and living God and say, Lord... God, I don't even know how to be humble. I don't even know what that means. The more I try, the more I try, the worse I make it. I need you to do it for me, Lord. Help my heart to be humble. Help my mind to be humble. Help me, Lord, to be humble before you. Help my spirit to be contrite. Hallelujah. 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 I want somebody that wants a real, genuine, and beautiful relationship with God. I want you to stand to your feet right now all across this house with uplifted hands and uplifted hearts and say, Lord God, I want humility. I want meekness. I want meekness. I want meekness. I want humility. I don't want boastfulness or pride or arrogance. I don't want, I don't want conceit. I want humility, the real kind, not the false kind where I think I'm more humble than anybody else. The real kind where you can use me, you can mold me and make me and shape me. I want real, honest humility where it's all about you, where it's all about you. 
I want you to know God didn't use David because David was so talented. God used David because David was so humble. God didn't use Nehemiah because Nehemiah was so talented. He used Nehemiah because Nehemiah was so humble. Hallelujah. I want a young person to come forward right now and just with all of their hearts say, Lord, I want you to use me. I want you to use me. I want you to hear me right now. I want you to hear me right now. One of the ministers in our church who's been on the mission field is from New Brunswick. He texted me on my way out here, Bishop Woodward, and he said, you're going to the youth convention where God called me to the mission field. He said, I was in the Atlantic District Youth Convention so many years ago, and God called me to missions. And I'll never forget that day. And I was reminded of that, Bishop, when you talked about the missionaries that have come out of this church out of this province that have filled the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Turned whole nations upside down out of New Brunswick. And those men and those women were humble. They were humble. They just said, Lord, if you can use anything, you can use me. Take my mind, take my mouth. Take my heart, take my hands. I'll play what you want me to play. I'll build what you want me to build. Just work in me as an instrument of your righteousness. God is not interested in what you can bring to the table. He's interested in what you'll bring to the altar. Bring it. Bring it. Bring whatever you've got. Bring whatever you... If all you've got is pain, bring your pain. He'll use that pain. If all you've got is heartbreak, bring the heartbreak. He'll use the heartbreak. If all you've got is a broken home, bring that broken home. God will use the broken home for His glory. The only talent you actually need is meekness and humility. It's great if you got the other stuff, but you don't need the other stuff. All you need is humility. Lift up your voice unto Him all across this house, all across this house, all across this house. Hallelujah. 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 No, I rebuke, I rebuke those feelings of worthlessness in Jesus' name. You have great value. You have great worth. God sees you. God formed you. He ordained you before he formed you in the belly. He or ordained you to be a prophet, to be a prophetess under the nations, to be a child and vessel of God, to be anointed of the Lord. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. I rebuke suicidal thoughts in Jesus' name. I rebuke self-harm in Jesus' name. I rebuke low self-esteem in Jesus' name. You are His. You are His. All you need is to be humble before Him. All you need is to be humble before Him. My God. I feel the Holy Ghost. There's some young people right now that if you will cast yourself down before him in Jesus' name, God is going to do something in your life so dramatic tonight at this very conference. God is going to do something dramatic in your life all across this house. Just cast yourself down before him and say, Lord, I humble myself before you. I humble myself before you. I give you my pain. I give you my heartache. I give you my... Ability, whatever I've got, I give it to you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 He had a In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus.